Welcome to Model Steam Engines for Beginners. This is part 12, to buy or not to buy, that is the question. It's very popular now to buy steam engines via the internet, and it's a great place to buy a steam engine. The only problem is, of course, is that you're just looking at a photograph, so you don't really know what you've got until you have the thing on the bench. Sometimes on these auction sites you'll see a video of the engine running, often just on compressed air. But mostly you're just buying from a photograph. This of course is a video, it's the engine mounted on my small turntable, so I can rotate the turntable and show you it from many angles. I wonder how many viewers can see exactly what's wrong with this engine from this rotating photograph. I can see at least six things wrong with this engine just by looking at the photograph. It's only really when I rotate the flywheel that I can see that there is something seriously wrong with this engine. A loose crankweb on the crankshaft isn't really very serious, but the fact that the crankweb is held to the crankshaft with a grub screw is quite serious. When I first looked at the crankweb, it looked like it was cracked. So I rubbed it with a needle file and found out no, it was just a mark in the casting, which is a good thing. The manner by which the crankweb is held to the crankshaft is not really badly engineered, but this is certainly not a good way to hold a crankweb to a crankshaft. And as you can see in the previous clip, the crankweb wobbles about on the crankshaft. So I think the first thing I'll do is take out the scrub screw and put it in my box of old grub screws. The best way to secure a crankweb to a crankshaft, apart from Loctite products like 601 or 638, is to drill a hole all the way through the crankweb and the crankshaft, but thankfully that's already been done with this engine, and then use a taper reamer to fit a taper pin. And before you really get started, it's a good idea to select the correct diameter taper pin. This one I'm using should be fine, so I can continue, and I can use the taper reamer to go all the way through the crankweb and the crankshaft. As this is an episode of Steam Engines for Beginners, and not Model Engineering for Beginners, I'm not going to go into great detail. Suffice to say that you need to put the reamer through a little bit at a time, and try frequent fittings of the taper pin. The first test fitting of the pin showed that the taper hole is still too small for the taper pin, so I tapped it out from the other side with a smaller taper pin, and reamed the hole once again with the taper reamer, this time going through a little deeper. I'll just leave the process running so you can see what I actually did. At this point, I would like to say to everyone out there who's thinking about buying a steam engine online, if the steam engine that you're looking at is painted this colour, then you should really proceed with caution, because if the builder painted the engine this colour, it could show that the builder has only just moved up from a Mammoth steam engine. Now there's nothing wrong with Mammoth steam engines before anybody writes in, I have several of them myself, they're very nice little steam toys. But a Mammoth steam engine is a very different thing to a Stuart Models Victoria. First of all, this is not an oscillating cylinder model, it's a proper slide valve model. Painting a larger steam engine in the same colour as your favourite Mamod is down to the builder really, but I have found in the past that sometimes the engines can be well built, sometimes they're a disaster, but either way, from my experience I have found that engines that are painted this colour can often have mechanical problems. This is a view of the rocking mechanism for the arm that controls the valve. Have a close look at it. Not only is it very badly made, it's badly finished, it's badly fitted, it's just bad. Have a closer look and you will see what I mean. There is everything wrong with it. On the right hand side of the assembly you will see the eccentric rod and it's stuck up in the air. That's supposed to hang down and push and pull the rocker arm from below. So it's time to get a plastic box for all the parts and start stripping it down. The steam chest cover and the steam chest seems to be quite well machined. Well that's something at least. And the flywheel looks okay, and the base looks okay. The main bearings are okay, but they're not split, so they can't be adjusted. It looks to me like the geometry of the crosshead is out, because the blocks do not have the cross pin in the centre. Also, the drilled and threaded holes on the cylinder for the cylinder covers come all the way through the cylinder flange. I could go on. Oh yes, and it's painted mammoth green with red mountings. But by far the worst and the most puzzling thing about this engine is that when I rotate the flywheel, the piston has compression at each end of the cylinder and nothing in the middle. And when I connect up an air supply to it, it never even tries to run. In this clip, I'm removing the two link bars that connect the rocking mechanism to the valve spindle. 
While I'm on the subject of these links, they're really badly made. They're not rounded at the end. They're not even shaped in any kind of a way. So they're going to go in the bin. I would make some more. It isn't in my schedule to actually rebuild this engine. I'm just using it for the purposes of this video. However, it is going to form part of the introduction to a video series I'm going to be doing next year. And the title of this series is How to Build a Model Steam Engine. And I'm going to be building a Stuart Victoria completely from scratch. I'm going to buy the casting set from Stuart's. I'm going to unpack the casting set and see it all the way through to completion. And you will see the engine in steam at the end of the video. But for now, back to this thing. And what is going on here, I ask myself. I've never seen this before, ever. Can you see the piston going back and forth? You can see it through the ports. Have a closer look. This is definitely not supposed to happen. I really have never seen this before. Someone's gone to the trouble of putting a milling cutter through the port straight down into the cylinder. And in my opinion, this definitely shows that the man who built this engine did not have a clue about how a steam engine actually worked. Time now for a much closer look, a complete disassembly. The conrod's been removed and I'm now removing the cylinder and having a look at it. Oh, and look at this. This is the end of the cylinder as you would look at it from the flywheel end. This must be the steam engine equivalent of a circus clown car. I mean, who would mill the ports in the centre of the cylinder? Someone who knows nothing about a steam engine, perhaps. A while back, I worked on a twin Victoria which was non-functional. But on that one, thankfully, nobody had attempted a repair like this. The problem is that these are sand castings, and the steamways from each end of the cylinder to the steam ports are created in the casting process. But the problem is that the sand is left behind, so the steamways are often blocked with sand. It would be very easy at the moment to be very smug about this and say, it's obvious that the steam ports were blocked. But in reality, it's not obvious. It's not something I've come across a lot. But it is a problem nevertheless. And the solution, before you start machining the casting, is to get a piece of brass wire like this, or a piece of steel wire provided it's thin, and poke away until you get all of the casting sand out of the casting. This is tedious and takes a while. But eventually the steam waves will become clear and the steam engine would then work, but not in this case because it's got two great big holes in the middle of the cylinder. And the question is, could this be repaired? And the answer to that is, well, yes, it could. I could sleeve the cylinder, which is currently one inch in diameter, down to, say, three quarters of an inch in diameter, using either a cast iron sleeve machined in the lathe or a phosphor bronze sleeve. Then all I would have to do is make a smaller piston and buy a suitable o-ring. Then I could carefully reassemble the engine and touch up the paintwork using copious amounts of mammod green and then I could describe it as a barn find or an engine that my grandfather made or one I got from a house clearance. And then the text could continue I know nothing about steam engines but I have run it on compressed air and it seems to run well. I have not tested it on steam. You see descriptions like this all the time on the internet and it really makes me smile. I'm sure one or two of them are genuine, but many sadly are not. And this engine is worth possibly £350 as a Stuart Victoria. That's a sort of going rate for a Victoria. It's on a very nice base. The base is the best part of the engine. At this point, you may be thinking, why did someone like me buy an engine like this in the first place? Surely I would have noticed what was wrong with it by the photographs on the advert on the internet. Back to the video for the moment, and as you can see, poking this sand out of the ports is taking some doing, and there are two ports to do, of course. But finally I can see light at the end of the tunnel, or should I say, I can see the brass rod in one of the ports on the port face. This, of course, is serving no purpose whatsoever other than to illustrate how the ports were blocked in the first place, because I'm not going to use this cylinder for anything at all. So back to the story of how I came by this wonderful engine. A friend of mine bought an engine from the auction site that we all know and love, and it didn't work. So he brought me the engine, and it was an absolute disaster area. Far worse than this one. I've never seen anything like it. I said to my friend that I wouldn't even use it as a doorstop, and he didn't seem too thrilled by that comment. But luckily, the person he bought it off lives quite close to me. I live in a little place called Dewsbury in West Yorkshire in the UK. So anyway, he arranged for the man to come and pick the engine up. But the man said at the same time, 
Oh, I have another engine. Would you rather swap me for that? So I suggested he brought this other engine for us to have a look at. And of course the other engine was this one. My friend didn't want it, so I gave him £100 for it. I knew there was something seriously wrong with it, but I thought, well, the castings are a lot more than that. Over the years I've collected quite a few Stuart castings, and a lot of them came off the auction site I've previously mentioned. And now these castings generally sit in a box in the workshop, and it's very handy to be able to look in the box if I require a specific casting. And here I'm pretending that I have a Stuart casting in the box, which I didn't really have. It was lurking elsewhere in the workshop. This is one that I bought a while back when I was repairing a Stuart Twin Victoria and never used it. In the end I only needed one cylinder for the Twin Victoria, so I had this one left over, and I got as far as putting it on the linisher just to clean off the sand scale ready for machining. So after all that, what am I going to do with this very badly made Victoria? The answer to that is nothing. It's going to sit on my shelves for a while. Very soon I'm going to be making a video called How to Build a Model Steam Engine and the first in the series is going to be a Stuart Models Victoria. This series is going to be very comprehensive and it will take me a lot of time and money to make so it will not be free on YouTube. It will however be available on a subscription service as well as being on DVD so you'll be able to watch it over and over again until you go into a coma or unconsciousness occurs. That's it for now, thanks for watching and I hope you found it